So this video is on brain tumors. And unfortunately, there's a lot of information that is fair game as when it comes to brain tumors. But fortunately for you, if you organize it with some sexy, dirty USMLE mnemonics, it's really not that hard. This is going to be free points for you on test day. And it's a huge section of neurology. Anybody who's flipped through first aid knows that neurology is a very, very long section. Lots of information that you need to know. But we're going to simplify it for your studying pleasure. So in this video, we're gonna talk about brain tumors. When we talk about brain tumors, you need to separate them into the tumors of adulthood or the tumors of childhood. And I've done that for you here. Tumors of adulthood include glioblastoma multiforme, oligodendroglioma, meningioma, hemangioblastoma, pituitary adenoma, and schwannomas. Children um, tend to get different tumors, and they include pilocytic astrocytoma, medulloblastoma, ependymoma, and craniopharyngioma, and pinealoma. Pinealoma, that's a hard one to say. We're going to start by talking about the tumors of adulthood, so we're going to focus on the left side of this chart. As I go through the video today, uh, we're going to talk about, just in general, what you need to know about the tumors, what you'll see on histology, and then I'll wrap up by giving you the mnemonics. After we cover all the adult tumors, we'll transition into the tumors of childhood, and we're going to just simplify everything. I'm really excited to share with you this video because it's very, very high yield. So this is the slide that you'll see on most of these tumors. Again, we're going to talk about what you need to know, just generally speaking, what you'll see on histology, and then I'll give you my favorite mnemonic. So we're going to get started with glioblastoma multiforme. So this is our first tumor of adulthood. And what you need to know in general are that these are highly malignant tumors. So they're very aggressive, very invasive, highly, highly malignant. And they tend to cross the corpus callosum. So they'll cross the midline when you see them on radiology. And this is pretty unique to this tumor. So I'm going to show you the picture on the next slide. But if you see that, it's pretty classically glioblastoma multiforme. On histology, you'll see something referred to as, quote, pseudopalisading tumor cells and these stain positive for GFAP or GFAP. So here's what a glioblastoma multiforme looks like. And as you can see, if you know where the corpus callosum is, which hopefully by this point in your career you do, this tumor crosses the midline and it creates what's called the butterfly appearance because it's sort of symmetrical on both sides of the corpus callosum. So glioblastoma multiforme, if you see anything resembling a butterfly or anything crossing the midline in the brain, it's going to be GBM. So if we come back to GBM, my mnemonic is glioplastoma multiforme. So we just changed the B to a P. And what does that tell us? Well, G for GFAT positive, P for pseudopalisading cells, and M for both midline and malignant. So we're going to keep it stupid simple here. GBM, glioblastoma multiforme. I say glioplastoma multiforme, GPM for GFAT, pseudopalisading, and midline malignant. That is your glioblastoma multiforme. So we're already one tumor done. You need to know everything that I said, but if you use the mnemonic, it beautifully summarizes all the high yield buzzwords for you. So if you see any mention of that stuff on exam day, you know that it's a glioblastoma multiforme. So don't get bogged down. Dirty USMLE is going to keep this simple. Our next tumor is the oligodendroglioma. And in general, there's really nothing that you need to know for this tumor. You really just need to know its histology. So you see things that are known as chicken wire capillary patterns. You see fried egg cells and you see these tumors tend to be calcified grossly. So this is really a big one for just histology. There's no general knowledge that I think is high yield for USMLE or COMLEX. The reason that they're called fried egg cells is because they have these classic round nuclei with clear cytoplasm. And it's sort of like if you fry an egg, you see that the yolk is very clear, um, you know, clearly defined, but it's surrounded by the clear cytoplasm, which would be um, your egg whites if you were to fry an egg. So I don't necessarily agree that this looks like a fried egg, but that's what pathologists and histologists call it. So that's what we go with. The round nuclei, clear cytoplasm, those are termed fried egg cells. So if you haven't guessed yet, our mnemonic is going to be oleg dendroglioma because all of these buzzwords have something to do with eggs. So the chicken wire capillary pattern, well, chickens lay eggs. The fried egg appearance, that's a no-brainer. And you get your calcium if you eat you know, a nice hearty breakfast with eggs. So calcified tumors, oligodendroglioma instead of oligodendroglioma. Let's keep it stupid simple, guys. That's all you need to know for oligodendroglioma. So if you're cool with that, you already know two tumors. We're crushing, cruising our way through this list. 
Let's keep the momentum going. So we're going to talk about meningiomas next. So meningiomas are benign and they tend to be superficially located because they occur on the meninges. And if you think about the anatomy of the brain, the meninges overlie the superficial aspect of the brain. So it's no surprise that a tumor that originally arises from the meninges will be superficially located. These are arachnoid in origin and think about the arachnoid mater in order to make the connection between their origin and the fact that it is a meningioma, so it's a tumor of the meninges. On histology, you'll see semoma bodies and spindle cells, and I'm gonna show you on this slide what this all looks like. So you can see at the top portion of these slides on CT scan, we see that the tumors are very superficially located because again, they're extensions of the meninges. So meningioma, meningi is in the name. You can see at the bottom of this slide, I'm showing you what a somoma body looks like. So somoma bodies are unique to just a few tumors in the body and meningiomas are one of them. Now, how do we remember all this, right? Dirty US Emily, what is your sexy, sexy mnemonic for keeping this simple in my brain? Well, you need to say men have problems with PSA. So men for meningioma, the first three letters of the tumor, and men have problems with elevations in PSA because when they get BPH, they have an increase in their prostate specific antigen. So that's what PSA stands for. If you haven't heard about that yet, you certainly will as you move forward in your career, but men have problems with their PSA. So PSA is our mnemonic. So P for somoma bodies, S for spindle cells, and A for arachnoid origin. If you can remember those three facts about a meningioma, that's everything that you really need to know, or at least that's everything that's very high yield. If they ask you a question about meningiomas that's not one of these three things, not P, not S, not A, then it's not worth the brain space to memorize. But that's what we do here at Dirty USMLE, guys. We keep this stupid, we keep this simple. Three tumors down, some more to go. Let's keep it rolling. Hemangioblastoma, probably one of the easier tumors to remember. So this is of blood vessel origin. It's an EPO producing tumor, so it can cause secondary polycythemia. It's associated with von hippel lindau syndrome. Very, very high yield to know that. And on histology, you'll see thin walled capillaries. So no surprise, the mnemonic, we're just breaking down the word for you. Oftentimes, if you're confused on USMLE, COMLEX, or even your in-class exams, all you need to do is look at the word to figure out what it ha you know, like what the answer is. So hemangioblastoma, so heme for blood, angio, angio means blood vessel, and blastoma is sort of describing the appearance grossly of the tumor. So heme for blood, so these are EPO-producing tumors, therefore blood, EPO, you know, EPO causes polycythemia, so that's a disorder of blood, so heme. Angio means blood vessels, so these are of blood vessel origins, and literally when you look at the histology, you see thin-walled capillaries, and then blastoma is irrelevant. So we're just breaking down the word to help remember this one. Sometimes it's not worth memorizing a mnemonic. Heme, angio, blastoma. Blood, blood vessel, blastoma. And then just to take it one step further to remember the association with von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, sometimes instead of saying von Hippel-Lindau, I say von Hippel-Lindau because it's sort of the same pronunciation that reminds me that not only are hemangioblastomas associated with von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, but they're also associated with EPO and they cause secondary polycythemia. So keep that stuff in mind. Very, very high yield associations, hemangioblastomas. We're going to talk about pituitary adenomas next, and this is probably the highest yield tumor on this entire slide in this entire section. So let's get right into it. With pituitary adenomas, you can have one of three forms of the tumor. So it can be a lactotroph, a somatotroph, or a non-functional pituitary adenoma. So what the hell do these words mean? Relax, I'm gonna break this down. Lactotrophs refer to one type of pituitary adenoma, and specifically, it's a pituitary adenoma that produces prolactin, hence the name prolactinoma. So in a prolactinoma, which is just a subtype of pituitary adenoma, which is termed a lactotrophic pituitary adenoma, aka a prolactinoma, it produces prolactin. And because of the inverse relationship between prolactin and FSH, any increase in prolactin will decrease your FSH, which will manifest as a certain very classic set of symptoms. So what does elevated prolactin cause? And likewise, what does decreased FSH cause? So in a female, you'll get things like galactorrhea and amenorrhea, right? In men, however, you'll get gynecomastia and decreased libido because you're inappropriately producing elevated levels of prolactin and you're shutting down FSH. So these are very classic symptoms that you should be on the lookout for. If you see that constellation of symptoms in the clinical vignette, 
chances are it's a pituitary adenoma and the sensitivity for it being a pituitary adenoma becomes even higher if they have other symptoms like headaches, etc. So that is a pituitary adenoma, but a very specific subtype of pituitary adenoma called a prolactinoma. Now let's talk about the somatotrophic pituitary adenoma. So the somatotrophic pituitary adenoma could be a tumor that produces one of four substances. It could produce growth hormone, it could produce TSH, it could produce ACTH, or it could produce FSH or LH. So no surprise here. These are all hormones that are secreted by the anterior pituitary. Okay. So when we talk about these uh, hormones, if the pituitary adenoma is a somatotroph and it produces growth hormone, you're going to see clinical uh, constellation of symptoms consistent with gigantism or acromegaly. Likewise, if it's a somatotroph that produces TSH, you'll see things like hyperthyroidism. If it's ACTH, ACTH producing, you'll see Cushing syndrome. And then FSH, LH, you'll see the same set of symptoms that you should see if you just understand the physiology behind these hormones. So my recommendation before you kind of memorize this and go through this lecture is to understand what these hormones do. So go through the endocrine section first because it's extremely high yield to be able to make that connection. So if you have a clinical vignette and the patient has tachycardia, you know, diaphoresis, but headache, and there's something seen on the CT scan, then it sounds like hyperthyroidism, but you see this tumor. So you got to connect the dots and say, this is a somatotrophic pituitary adenoma that's producing TSH. So that's how you approach these problems. So somatotrophs produce the hormones that come from the anterior pituitary, and the symptoms are exactly what you would see if you just had elevations in any one of these hormones. So not too difficult to understand. The non-functional pituitary adenomas don't produce hormones, hence the name non-functional. So what kind of symptoms will you see on test day? Well, you'll see things consistent with mass effect. And mass effect refers to headache and bitemporal hemianopia. So the bitemporal hemianopia is the symptom that you get when you compress the optic chiasm. And because of the location in the pituitary, the pituitary adenoma has a tendency to compress the optic chiasm and cause bitemporal hemianopia. So right now, I want you to pause this video and go on Google and Google bitemporal hemianopia. And I want you to see what that changes in the visual fields. Because if they describe what you see on Google images when you Google bitemporal hemianopia, they're probably hinting at a pituitary adenoma. So make sure you understand how the visual field changes if the buzzword is bitemporal hemianopia, aka a non-functional pituitary adenoma compressing the optic chiasm. And then obviously headache because you have mass effect, you have a tumor growing in the brain, kind of subtly pushing the brain in a certain direction. So that is mass effect for a non-functional pituitary adenoma. So how the hell do we remember all this stuff? That's the question. This is really easy, guys. Remember adenoma. So adenoma because you're adding on all of these hormones in the brain or you're adding on the actual mass of the tumor to create mass effect. So pituitary adenomas add hormones into the picture like prolactin, GH, TSH, ACTH, FSH, LH, or they add their mass into the picture to create headache and bitemporal hemianopia. Very, very high yield tumor to understand. I think I simplified it well for you, but make sure that you understand everything on this slide. That is pituitary adenoma. We're going to wrap up the adult tumors by talking about the famous schwannoma. So the schwannoma uh, gets a lot of love on tests because it has a very classic presentation. So it occurs at the cerebellopontine angle. So Google that really quickly so you see where that is. But when you have a tumor sitting in the cerebellopontine angle, it has a tendency to affect cranial nerve 7 and cranial nerve 8. So your facial nerve and your vestibular cochlear nerve. So the thing that you need to know about schwannomas, in addition to which cranial nerves they affect, is that if they're bilateral, you want to think neurofibromatosis type 2. So if they're unilateral, it's just in a schwannoma existing in isolation. But if you have two schwannomas, right, bilateral schwannomas, you should think of NF2. That's very, very classic association, very, very high yield to know that. On histology, you need to memorize that schwannomas are S100 positive. So if you need a mnemonic, you need some dirty USMLE loving, just remember schwannoma. So the SCHW, very, very high yield, S for S100, C for cerebellopontine angle, and the H and the W tell you which cranial nerves are affected. So the H, uh, hearing is affected, that's cranial nerve eight, and the W, winking, is affected, that's cranial nerve seven. So very, very high yield 
schwannoma, SCHW, just remember what those stand for, S100, cerebellopontine, hearing and winking, that's cranial nerve 7 and cranial nerve 8. If you have bilateral schwannomas, it's a neurofibromatosis type 2, very high yield association. So that's all of the adult brain tumors. Those are the hard ones, guys. So that's done. We've covered all the hard stuff. You have mnemonics for all the hard stuff. The childhood tumors are a lot easier. And the reason is, is that childhood tumors, you just need to know maybe one or two buzzwords associated with each tumor. And if you know those buzzwords, you are golden. You are absolutely golden. They don't ask a lot of this uh, on exams. So we're just going to cover the buzzwords. So we're going to do this all in one fell swoop. So I'm going to put the, the buzzwords on the right side of the slide, and then I'll go through them one at a time and explain how you remember this. So the tumors are pilocytic astrocytoma, medulloblastoma, ependymoma, craniopharyngioma, and pineoloma. Okay. What you need to remember corresponding to the tumor is exactly across from it, is that in pilocytic astrocytomas, you get things called Rosenthal fibers, and they stain positive for GFAP. Okay, so how do we remember the association between pilocytic astrocytoma and Rosenthal fibers, right? So random. The way that I think about this, and you sort of need to be a sports fan to understand my mnemonic here, is that there is a sports agent named Drew Rosenhaus. So I remember Rosen for Drew Rosenhaus. And then in astrocytoma, I think of the Houston Astros. And even though he's a football agent, he represents football players, I think of him as representing uh, players who play for the Houston Astros. So that is Drew Rosenhaus from Rosenthal Fibers representing players on the Houston Astros in astrocytoma. So very, very high yield to know that association. That's my silly sports mnemonic. Sorry if you're not a sports fan. Next for medulloblastomas, you need to know about Homer Wright rosettes. So what the hell, how do we remember this? Again, sorry, but you kind of got to be a sports fan for this one. If you want to hit a homer run or a home run out of the ballpark, you need to blast the ball. So you blast the homer run or the homer right rosettes. So for homer right rosettes, you blast the homer run out of the ballpark. That is the high yield mnemonic for medulloblastoma. For ependymoma, you get something called perivascular pseudo rosettes. So one buzzword to know here perivascular pseudo rosettes. So I sort of create a story in my mind and I think about my mama, right? My mom, ependymoma, ependymama, ependymami, however you want to do it. And you forget that it's your mom's birthday. So you give her a rose, which is pseudo rosette, but since it's pseudo rosette, it's pseudo means sort of, or kind of, or like somewhat. So it's pseudo rosette. You, you gave your mom a rose to somewhat make up for the fact that you forgot her birthday. That's just how I always remembered that. It's sort of a stupid story, but it, it absolutely works. So if you get ependymoma, aka ependymami, ependymama, just remember that you sort of forgot her birthday. So you gave her a sort of makeup gift, which was a sort of rose, aka pseudo rosette. So that's ependymoma. Um, for craniopharyngioma, all you need to memorize is that these are remnants of Rathke's pouch that give rise to craniopharyngiomas. So there's no uh, mnemonic there. It's just a brute memorization. If you see Rathke, Anywhere on your exam, the answer is cr craniopharyngioma. Like, don't, don't think twice, just pick it. That's the answer. And for pineoloma, it causes paranoid syndrome. But you remember the P's, pineoloma for paranoid syndrome. Uh, look into what that entails exactly. I would Google it. It's a little lengthy for an explanation in this video. But the association itself between pineolomas and paranoid syndrome is extremely, extremely high yield. So know that association. But guys and gals, that's it. You now know all of the brain tumors that occur in adulthood, in childhood. There's no reason to go through any other resource and learn anything else about these freaking tumors. They're really annoying to learn. And if you're not going to be a neurologist, you really don't have to know that much about them. Just know the buzzwords that I've presented to you in this video. Remember to check out the description of this video. Give us a follow on Twitter. If you want us to make a video about a certain topic, all you got to do is tweet at us and I'll feature your tweet in the next video when I create the video for the topic you requested.